Hilchais Mase HaKarbonais Perek Asiri, The Laws of Sacrificial Procedures, Chapter 10. And this chapter is not so much about procedures as much as it is about eating. Because the Ramam spent the first nine chapters of these laws talking about how to do all the sacrifices, how to bring them. Now the next stage in the procedure of the Karban is to eat it. So today and tomorrow we're going to get the laws about eating the Karbanot. Says the Ramam Alocha Aleph, Achilas Hachatas Veha'osha Mitzvah Sase. Eating the meat of the sin offering and the guilt offering is a positive commandment for the Koyanim. Shanema, as it says, Veachlu Oisam Asher Kupar Bohem, they shall eat them, the one which was used for atonement. In other words, the offerings, sin offering, guilt offering, which is to atone for the owners, the Koyanim also have to eat it. And when they eat it, the Kohanim eat the meat, and through the eating of the Kohanim, whoever brought the Korban becomes atoned for. From this Pasuk we learn that any other holy sacrifice which the Kohanim eat, that when they eat it, it's a mitzvah. It's also a positive commandment for the Kohanim to eat the leftover of a flower offering. Whenever you bring a flower offering, we're going to see starting in chapter 12, about that. There was one what's called kmitza, three fingers full, went onto the Mizbeach, and the rest was eaten by the Kohen. I mean, it's a mitzvah. Shanemar, that's the next Pasuk here, this is the one talking about the Korban Mincha, v'hanoiseres mimena, yoichlu aren uvanov, whatever remains from it, meaning from the flower offering, Aaron and his sons will eat it. Now in both verses, it's talking about male Kohenim. So he says, aharon uvanav, oisam them, is talking about Aaron and his sons. The sin offering and the guilt offering and the leftover of the flower offering can only be eaten by male kohanim in the temple courtyard. This picture I showed you before is supposed to be a depiction of this chamber in the Azara where they used to eat. Looks like they're eating lunch, but they're actually eating karbanot. It should be this allocated area. Somewhere, somewhere in the Azara. They had, a, they had a place for it, but technically you can eat it anywhere in the temple courtyard. If they ate it inside the actual temple building, fine, it's eaten. But ideally, it should be in the courtyard. Shanemar, how do we know this? That only the male Kohanim could eat it. So already you see it in the verses that it's referring to the males. But there's a special verse later in the Torah where it says, L'chol min chasam, u'l'chol chatasam, u'l'chol ashamam, all the flower, sin, and guilt offerings, b'kaydash ha-kadashim toichlenu, they should be eaten in the holiest of holy areas. Kol zachar All males could eat it. It's really two verses together. So the point is you see both, both details. Kredash HaKadashim. In the holy of areas they have to eat it. That's the temple courtyard. And only males. Even though it doesn't mention it clearly in the Torah, but there's a fourth category where the Kohenim also eat, which is the two lambs that are brought on Shavuos that are called the Shalmei Tzibur, the communal peace offerings, they also have the same law as the Chathas and an Asher, and therefore they're eaten in the holiest of areas. Now, let's go down one level to what's called Kodashim Kalim, the lighter sacrifices. Chazav Shaikh Shel Shlamim, the breast and the thigh, that we learned about yesterday. I couldn't show you the pictures yesterday because it was Shabbos, but this is the Chazav Shaikh. If you look at an animal, the pink part is what's called the breast, from the neck down to the paunch, to the stomach area, and the Shaikh is the top part, the meaty part of the right back leg. Every single time you brought a peace offering, the Kohanim would get this portion to eat. The owner would eat the rest of it, but the Kohanim would eat this. So this part, because it's a lower level sacrifice, has to be eaten by the Kohanim, but it could be male or females. Yeah, meaning the daughter of a Kohan or a wife of a Kohan. Shanem Arbohem because it says about the shlamim, l'chanesatim, here it's clear. L'chanesatim u'levanecha v'livnei secha. I gave them to you and to your sons and to your daughters. So, so you would have had to have taken them home. Because they could have yes, been because, because they could be eaten in Yerushalayim. Anywhere in Yerushalayim, that's true. V'chein hamura mitoida v'hamura me'il nazir. And the same thing is, the portions that are removed from the Thanksgiving offering and from the, lamb, the ram of the Nazarite that goes to the Kayanim, also, they can be eaten by both males and females. Shanemar, as it says, Koil trumais hakadoshim asha yorimu v'nei Yisrael Hashem. All removals that the that Jews make from sacrifices for Hashem, 
Nasati lecha ulevanecha v'livnesecha. Again, I gave it to you, to your sons, to your daughters. So it's clear that these lower level karbanot could be eaten by males and females. The chenab chayr, and also firstborn offering, which we're going to have a whole set of laws in the next book, but it also goes to the kohanim. It's for males and females. Sharei nemar boy, because it says in the pasuk just before, uvesaram yiyalach, their meat, their meat meaning the bechor, firstborn meat should be for you. Just like the breast of the waving and the right thigh, which you get from the peace offering, treated the same way. So same way, peace offering, they goes to males and females. The Bukhar also goes to males and females. And these last korbanot could be eaten in the entire city. Not only in the temple, but the whole old city of Jerusalem. As it says, this is again talking about the shlamim, right? The, the, the breast and the thigh that's removed. You should eat it in a pure place. Now, when it comes to the holy of holy sacrifices, what does it say in the Torah? You have to eat it in kadosh, in a holy place. So the Rambam learns from this contrast, lo ne'mar bahen kadosh. Doesn't say holy place, shehiha azara, which would be the temple courtyard, ela toher, only pure. Shehukol machne Yisrael, which is the entirety of the Jewish camp, the whole old city. Which corresponding to that in the desert was the Machane Yisrael, was the Yerushalayim in, in uh, all generations. Same laws applies to the tithe offering and the Passover sacrifice. They can be eaten um, in the whole of Yerushalayim. Because they are the lighter sacrifices like a peace offering. A window inside the wall and the thickness of the wall is considered like inside Jerusalem. So if you wanted to have a snack of the carbon on the top of the wall or in the window, you're good. And the bricks. On the bricks. Huh? On the bricks of the wall. Yes, on the bricks, exactly. So we've covered the who and we've covered the where. Now we have to cover the when. How long do you have, what's the time frame, the basic time frame to eat all these sacrifices? So the Rambam says, Hashlamim ne'echalim, peace offerings can be eaten, biyoyim hazvicha, v'chol halayla, Shlomim can be eaten the day you offered them, the following night, and the next day till sunset. Shanemar, as it says, and here we have to look at the middle verse. A person brought a voluntary sacrifice. It says, On the day he offers the offering, it could be eaten, and the next day. And then it says in the next verse, if you eat from the, the meat of the shlamim, on the third day, it's no good. No good. Yes. From this you learn. And they can be eaten for two days and one night. This is referring to whether it's the Kohen's part, the owner's part. And the firstborn offering, tithe offering is the same laws. For they are uh, also light sacrifices like the peace offering. Avol hatoida, but the Thanksgiving offering. Avol pishi kadoshim kalim, even though it's also lighter level sacrifice. But Torah says clearly you have less time. Eina ne'echeles ala biyei mazvicha im halayla. It can only be eaten on the day of the offering and the following night. That's it till the morning. Shanei marba, right in the t- beginning over here. Uvesar zevach toidas, right? It says the Thanksgiving offering. Shlamav biyoyim karbana yeyachel. Only on the day of the offering, he, it can be eaten. No leaving till the morning. Which means you also have the following night. Because by Kadashim, by holy things, the night follows the day. The rest of the Jewish calendar, it's night first, then day. The, night, the day follows the night. But in sacrificial issues, the night follows the day. So if you're able to eat it that day, that means you have that day and the following night. Up to sunrise. Huh? Technically up to sunrise. We'll see you in a second. The Chain El Nazir, same thing applies to the ram of the Nazir. It's the same law, because they, they both have bread. They can be eaten that day and that, day and that night. And the bread that comes with them is the same laws. Again, the part of the Kohenim where the owner doesn't make a difference. And the same applies to all holy of holy sacrifices, sin offering, guilt offering, communal peace offering, leftover flower offerings. Everything can be eaten only for that day and the following night. Because it says, and Dharma uses the same verse, and even though this verse is talking about a toida, 
Kala karbonis mamashma. The word karbonai includes all sacrifices. Because I could have said, we're talking about the toida. Let's say, bayoim hahu ye achil, or whatever. Why say bayim karbonai? All sacrifices. Chutz min ashlamim, shepeyash bayan akasov, ubcheru maestra daimim lem, with the exception of Torah makes an exception. But the peace offering is as two days and one night, and the firstborn offering, tad offering, is the same thing, so fine. So sacrifices have two time frames either the day and the following night, or the day and the following night and the next day. Now, call all these sacrifices, which could only be eaten day and night, din toira, by biblical law, you have all night, till dawn. But the sages, in order to distance us from Averas, they said, they can only meet until midnight. This is the first Mishnah in all of Shas. Masachat Brachot. The very first Mishnah talks about Kriya Shema. Right, that Shema can, the, of the nighttime could be done all night, but the sages said, back it up to midnight just to stop people from doing Averas. And he gives two more examples. One of them is this law. Any sacrifice that can only be eaten for one day and a night should be going till dawn, but you have to back it up till um, midnight. And the same thing is for, we had a couple of days ago, Hector Chalavim Ve'evarim. If you began to offer a sacrifice by day, and then it was still left over to the night, you really have till dawn, but the sage said till midnight. Halachates. So we covered the who, the where, and the when. And now that Amam goes back to the who to define more which kind of a coin, what kind of status do you have to have in order to eat sacrificial meat? It says that Amam Halachates, Kala Karbana, Yisbin Kadashim, 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 Kala. All sacrifices, whether holy of holies, or lighter ones. You have to be ritually pure and you have to have a bris. So really, I, maybe I, I, I misspoke before, it shouldn't only be kohenim. Even regular Jews, when they eat a peace offering or a Passover sacrifice, they have to be pure and they have to have a bris. Even if you are the type of impurity in which you have to go to the mikvah, wait for sunset, and then the next day bring a sacrifice, it's called mechusar kipurim, so even if you already went to the mikvah, the sun set, but you didn't bring your sacrifice yet, you still can't eat sacrificial meat. A person who was born with his genitalia covered, he might be a male, which means he doesn't have a bris, he can't eat sacrificial meat. But a hermaphrodite, both organs, if he gets a bris on the male organ, he can eat at least the lighter sacrifices. Huh? Yeah? No, even a regular Jew. Even a regular Jew for his peace offering. When you eat the sacrificial meat, you can eat it with anything. Even the Kohanim, it's the holy of holy portions. They could eat their portion uh, with whatever food they want. They can mix it with mustard. That's the example in the Gemara. They can mix it with whatever they want. They have a salad. doesn't matter. And they can change the way that they eat it. You can have it roasted, boiled, cooked. You could even spice it with non-holy spices. But you cannot use truma spices to spice your holy food. Because with the sacrificial meat, if it stays beyond its time frame, so it becomes disqualified. If you're going to spice the meat with truma spices and you're going to leave the meat over, so you're now making truma disqualified as well. Whatever bones remain, get a ribeye steak, you know, and then there's the bone. Mutaris, it's totally permitted. You can make them into utensils. They used to do this, like make bone, bone vessels. But you can break so, the bone? Huh? Yeah. Only Korban Pesach, he cannot break the bone. That's a special law by the Passover sacrifice. You're right. No, no bone breaking. But other sacrifices, you can surely take the bones, do whatever you want with them. It's only the meat that, that's, that's holy. If they only had a little bit of food. It wasn't a busy day in the temple. Only a couple of sacrifices. The business was slow. The business was slow. Then you can bring into the meal both chulin and truma food. You can't spice it, but you can have other truma bread or whatever you have over there. So that the, the sacrificial meat should be eaten in a full stomach. 
there was a business is fast. There's a lot of sacrifices that day. You cannot, you cannot mix any other foods with it. So it shouldn't be eaten what's called like a fat eating. It's like you're, you're, you're stuffed, you're too full. Same thing applies to leftover flour offerings. Same law. If you have a little bit, supplement it with other food. You have a lot, eat it by itself. Yud base. You cannot take a sin offering and guilt offering and cook it with Thanksgiving offering or Nazarite's offering, even though they're the same time frame. They both can be eaten one day and the following night. Because you lessen the who and the where. Sin offering, guilt offering, only male con. Thanksgiving offering, males and females. Sin offering, guilt offering, could be only in the temple courtyard. Thanksgiving offering, anywhere in Yerushalayim. So you don't want to lessen opportunity for eating Kodashim, so you cannot cook them together. You have the parts that are removed from the Thanksgiving offering or the Nazarite's offering, and you have a firstborn offering or a peace offering. They're both low-level sacrifices. They can both be eaten by males and females. They can both be eaten uh, in the whole Yerushalayim. But what's the problem with now with this mix? Because the time frame is different. Right? The shlamim, you have two days and one night. This, only one day and one night. Interesting. What if you have a shlamim that's on the second day? It's already on the second day. And you want to cook it with a sin offering and a guilt offering that was brought today. Says that I'm here, you have big problems. All three go down. There's less people to eat it, because you have the chatas and the asham, only males. There's less place, same reason, it's holy of holies, only in the azara. And it's also less time because of the shlamim. On the second day of the shlamim, you only have till sunset. Chatas va asham you have till the, ne- till the following night. If you're taking it sunset, no good. But if everything is the same, you can cook it. Sin offering, guilt offering, cook together. Um, Thanksgiving offering, Nazareth offering, cook together. Firstborn offering and Shlamim offering, cook together. If you have a cut of meat, of holy of holy sacrifice, or pigul, pigul we're going to explore later on in this book, pigul means disgusting, and it refers to a sacrifice that was brought with the improper intent. Machshava. A Kohen has to have a proper intent when he brings a sacrifice. If there's a bad intent, the whole thing is disqualified. Noisar is leftover meat. Meat that was left past its proper time frame. So in either of these cases, if one cut of this meat got cooked with other cuts of meat, those cuts are forbidden for non kohanim but they're permitted to Kohanim. Even though it's Pigul? Uh, even though it's Pigul... Even though it's forbidden, how do we explain that? Yeah. So one explanation is that Ramam himself writes elsewhere that it's talking about a case of Batal Bishishim. There was already 60 times the, the piece. Oh, so the, it's, so, so the, the prohibition is disqualified. Mm-hmm. But it's still only permitted to Kohanim. Regular meat. Psar Taiva is like, you know, meat of desire that you have for supper was cooked together with sacrificial meat, holy of holies, lighter holiness. So the meat, it's kosher, but it's now it can only be eaten by a ritually pure person, not an impure person, because this might be karbanot in there. Let's take a look at some of the verses when it comes to the sacrifices. When it comes to the burnt offering, what does it say? When a Kohen brings a burnt offering, the height of the burnt offering goes to the cone. V'nem ar bechatos. By a sin offering, it says over here in the second verse, ha-koyen ha-mechate o'isa yechlana. The Kohen who did the forgiveness services, he gets to eat it. V'nem ar ba'asham. Also by the guilt offering, it says up, up here. Ha-koyen asher yechaper bo'y lo'yiyya. The Kohen who d- achieves atonement, it goes to him. V'nem ar bishlamim. And also by the peace offering, it says, la-koyen ha-zeirik es dam ha-shlamim lo'yiyya. It belongs to the Kohen who sprinkles the blood of the peace offering. Even by a flower offering, it says over here, the Ramam uses the word hakoyen, but in the verse it says lakoyen, lakoyen hamakriv oisa loyia or siya, it goes to the Kohen who offers it. Now, does that mean 
that if the, whoever was involved in it gets to eat it, not necessarily. When Torah says it goes to the Kohen who brought it, it means if he was fitting. A Kohen who is fitting to serve, it, to serve in the temple, he's the one who gets to eat. Whoever wasn't fit at the time of the eating, let's say he was ritually impure, he cannot eat it, even if he becomes pure later in the evening. In other words, I misspoke, just to, just to edit. The, the verse implies that only the Kohen who brings it gets to eat it, which is pretty much impossible. It means if you're the Kohen who brings the sin offering, you have to eat all the meat. No. Torah is just saying that you have to be a proper Kohen. If you want to eat it, you have to have been a proper Kohen who could have sacrificed it at the time of the eating, at the time of the sacrifice. Avol in chaluka, but with regards to who gets it, hakoyla anshe bes av shemakrivin bayosayet, doesn't go to one Kohen, it goes to everyone who was on daily watch. Whoever was there that day gets the sacrifices. The kulam chelkim mechokachi amikdash ish keachiv, everyone gets a portion in all the sacrifices of the day, each man like his brother, bein zeh shehikriv, bein achiv sheimei b'tishalai hikriv, whether it's him, the person who actually sacrificed it, or his brother who's just with him in the temple but didn't do the, the actual offering. Halacha tezvav, if so, if it's true that everybody who's on site, on duty that day, gets a part in the, in the sacrifices, why would Torah differentiate when it comes to flower offerings between baked ones and unbaked ones? What does it say over here? By the baked ones it says, Any flower offering baked in an oven goes to the Kohen who brings it. But by the next ver- very next verse, flower offerings that are actually flour, not baked, it says, Any mincha mixed with oil and it's dry goes to all the sons of Aaron, a man like his brother. Which sounds like there's a difference. The baked one, taket goes only to one Kohen and only the dry one goes to a bunch of Kohenim. How do we make sense of that? Why? Uh, says the Rambam. Yeah, the dry one goes to the bnei Aaron. That's what it sounds like. You're telling me now, but no. Even when Torah says it goes to an individual Kohen, it's really referring to all the Kohenim, but you see Torah clearly differentiates. One Mincha says this Kohen, here it says all the Kohenim. It says the Rambam, it's not because the law is different. It's because there's a difference in how you divide it. Sheha Afuya, if you have a baked uh, Mincha, when they divide it, Whatever you get as your portion, even if you get a tiny amount, it's baked already, so it's fit for you. You can eat it right away. But the flour offerings, if you're going to divide it amongst everybody, every cone is going to walk away with this little amount of flour. It's not even edible. Just flour. You can't need it, you can't bake it. Therefore, without the verse, one might think, Logically speaking, why don't we do this? Instead of dividing every flower offering, let's see, today there was 10 flower offerings in the temple, let's give every colon one flower offering. Therefore, Torah has to say, even though it doesn't make sense, even though it goes against logic, it has to be shared equally. Every man like his brother, split it up. From here the sages learned, you don't divide one flower offering for another. Even if it's the same type. Baked in a pan for baked in a pan, flour with flour. Each one, Individually, you divide it up, everyone gets their portion. Whatever they walk away with, that's what they walk away with. And from here we learn, You don't divide proportionally. So you take this bird, I get this bird, you take this sin offering, I get that one. Or the breast and the thigh. Whoever's on site has to divide everything. So you're asking before about family style. Yeah, that's what happens. You put it on the table, and every portion, every Kohen needs to get a portion of every offering. You cannot divide offering to offerings. 
every guy needs to take part at everything. Uh, a child, a minor, cannot take a portion of lighter, even lighter sacrifices. Even though it's permitted to give him. Kohanim can give him parts, even of the highest level sacrifices, but he cannot take his own. A woman and a hermaphrodite didn't get any portions in the holy sacrifices of the temple. It says, man like his brother. Only if you're a definite man. But if he had a blemish, whether permanent or passing, whether you were born with it, or you were blemished and later on became disqualified, you can take a portion, no problem. As it says clearly in the verses, a person who has a blemish can eat from the bread of his God, holiest of holy, and the regular holies. Again, as long as he meets the criteria for eating. If he was impure, he cannot divide it to eat at night. We had this before in discussing the laws of the Kohen Gadol. A high priest doesn't have to wait for any divisions. He walks in, takes whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Only a Kohen who was fit to eat at the time of the offering could actually go home with a portion of meat. But anybody who could not have eaten during the time of the service, even though he's fit for service and fit to eat that night, he cannot take a portion to save for the night. What's an example? Ketzat. Somebody went to mikvahs waiting for sunset. Somebody who already had sunset waiting to bring a sacrifice. Somebody who was in deep mourning on the day of burial for a relative. Whether he's a high priest or a regular priest, cannot take a portion home to eat at night. If you want to think about it in terms of simple signs, the Ramam says, a Kohen who cannot eat, cannot serve. Except for a high priest who's in deep mourning, he could bring sacrifice, he just can't eat, as we explained in the laws of the high priest. Also on the flip side, if he can't serve, he can't eat either. Except for a person with a blemish who's explicit in the Torah. Some more signs. If a Kohen can't take home meat, he can't take home the hide. The hide of many sacrifices went to the Kohenim. If you can't eat, you can't take on the heights. Even if you were impure, only when the blood was sprinkled. By the time the offering was offered, you're already pure. No taking meat. As it says, If you offer the blood and the fats from the sons of Aaron, you get the, the thigh. Which means, you have to be pure and fitting for service from the moment of sprinkling until after the bringing of the fats. Let's say you were pure during the sprinkling. You became impure. You went to the mikveh. And by the time they offered these fats, you're already pure again. It's a doubt. Do we take or not? If he grabs it, we won't take it away from him. But we're not going to give it to him initially. If you have a communal sacrifice which was offered in impurity, as is possible to happen, even though the impure people are part of the offering, they still don't take home a piece of meat. Even for the evening, because they cannot eat it. Eating maintains its laws. Even if it was sacrificed in impurity, it's got to be eaten in purity.